Good morning, this is Sunday School, Acts chapter number 15, and we are in part number 20. So just so you know, not that it really matters, I do that for YouTube, which I've been uh, negligent in posting, so I apologize for that. But I'm going to get there, it's going to happen soon enough. We're actually going to work on some live streaming, so hopefully by the time you hear this, there will be some live streams happening. Um, I will work on that. Yep, something like that, you know, capture some of those other things. He sent me a text this morning, he said, upload, download the app. Yeah, I'm gonna work. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get a Verizon. I'm just gonna get another iPad and just put Verizon on it, or I'm gonna get a Verizon 4G LTE card, bring my laptop in here, plug it in, or probably just do an iPad with Verizon built in. Stick it up on a stand, hit the record button, and go to town. That's just gonna make things a whole lot easier. The the few hundred dollars in the iPad will be saved in my time, not having to try to sit there and, and uh, do uh, do those the messages. It, it takes me a solid two hours every Sunday whenever I have to do those messages. It's 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 a lot of work. And so. So yeah, and then when I have a lot going on, sometimes it takes me like a whole day to post like you know 15 sermons on there. I, I don't even know how far back I am right now. It's bad. And then you, you know you get further back and you procrastinate, and then it gets worse and worse, and never gets any better. And then you secretly say in your mind like, oh, I'll just do uh, I'll just do one a day for the next 15 days. And you're like, nah, I'm not gonna do that either. Because it means I have to do it every 15 days. I don't really want to do it. So you know I'm the I'm the king of procrastination. So I'll do that until the day I die. So anyways, uh, Acts chapter number 15, and uh, I, I want to read verse number 19. It says, Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turn to God. So I was showing you these pronouns between we and them, you know, showing that there are two different groups of people, and James is identifying that there are two different distinct groups of people, two different distinct operations. Those are the Jews and the Gentiles in his mind. And of course, rightfully so, he's a Jew. He's been operating under these for a long, long time. Uh, seeing the Lord Jesus Christ, he understands that earthly ministry. He was there when Jesus Christ said, go not into the way of the Gentiles and enter, enter, not enter in, into no city of the Samaritans, but go rather the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He was there. He heard that statement. He was there with the Syrop Syrophoenician woman when you know he called her a dog and give not that which is holy to the, to the dogs and all of that stuff, right? He's familiar with that understanding. He knows what Deuteronomy 4 is and how no other nation can say that the God is the God of Israel and all of that. So he's, you know, continually in his mind thinking in that regard. Now, Paul makes very bold statements like, in Christ there is neither Jew or Greek or bond or free, male or female. And all of a sudden, like, whoa, 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 what are you talking about now? James doesn't understand that at this point in time, right? He's not familiar. He's not, he doesn't get that concept. He's not really understanding because he's not really a part of, what's, of what is happening there, right? He's not sent to the Gentiles any longer. I mean, really, his ministry now is sitting there with the Jews. He's doing Jewish ministry, right? Now, what we're going to see is there's a grouping of people between the Jews and the Gentiles that they're, they're together there in Galatia, right? So if you turn to, to Galatians chapter number 2 and verse number uh, uh, 11 and 12, uh, we'll read 12. It says, <clears throat> for before that certain came from James. So who would that be? Would that be Gentiles? Well, no, of course not, right? No Gentiles came from James. Jews came from James. And when the Jews came from James, right, he, that is Peter, did eat with the Gentiles, right? But when they were come, so when the Jews, that was with James, came to Galatia, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them, and here's your, here's your definition of who these people are that came from James, fearing them which were of the, what's that word? Circumcision. And is this the circumcision uh, that is of the heart? No. What is the circumcision? This is the fleshly identification with the covenant, right? These are the people who say, we are Abraham's seed, here is the covenant. Here is the circumcision that we have. This is us, right? We are God's chosen people. And it's really interesting when you see how, the, how Paul lays this out later in Romans chapter 11. He says, now, I want you to be understanding here. Lest you be wise in your own conceits. And so when you get conceited about the thought process that you've replaced Israel for good, that's when you get replacement theology. That's when you get into an, an ideology of that you're now spiritual Israel and they're no longer. That, that's all bunk, right? That, that's, that's, not, that's not the case. It's not true. What God is now doing, and if you think about this, the whole entire concept of Israel being gone or, or done away with is, is answered in that, that verse in Romans chapter 11 because blindness in part has happened to Israel. Well, there you go, right? Oh, well, well, wait, wait, that's the spiritual. No, 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 that's not how it works, right? That he continually defines Israel as being, he says, Romans chapter number nine, right? He says they are, they are not all Israel that are of Israel, and that's where he gets into people get a little bit hairy. But he continually shows that from the, from the nationalistic Israel standpoint, do they have a benefit? Yes, much every way. 
Chief of them is community the oracles of God. I love how it says much every way. But going back here to Galatians chapter 2, these guys of the circumcision who are there in Galatia, they're participating in stuff with the Gentiles. Why? Well, it's incredibly re relaxing to live as a Gentile under liberty and under grace, right? Do you want to go back to Jerusalem? We can show you what happens there, what takes place there. Well, you're going to go up to put a vow on your head and shave your head and do all the, the rigmarole that is Acts chapter 21 as they continue to live like, like Jews, right? So they have this thing in their mind that, that, and rightfully so, that they're up there, that they're above, but the conceited notion that would fill a Gentile's mind is we are better, we are, we've, we've replaced, no, no, no. You must understand that the whole purpose and, 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 uh, and, and goal of Gentiles being raised up is for what? For provocation. To provoke who? To provoke the Jews to jealousy and go, well, wait, 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 he's our God. Well, yeah. See the God of the Jews? What, Rome, Rome, end of Romans chapter 3 when we get there, right? We're going to look at the end of Romans chapter 3. He goes and says, is he the God of the Jews only or the God of the Gentiles? Only? He's the God of everybody. He's everybody's God. And it's really interesting, that whole concept, all of a sudden, well, how do you reconcile verses like that with verses like Deuteronomy chapter 4, right? So we'll, we'll go back and, and forth and hit some of this, but I want to show you that in, in Galatia, which is one of the main you know, books that we have regarding this issue of Acts chapter 15, there are those that trouble you with what? trouble you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be saved, which James says, to whom we gave no such commandment, right? None. Uh, we didn't give any such commandment. Now, we talked last week that he gave no such commandment to who? To, to, to them, to go out and tell the Gentiles that. Now, do I think in his mind, in James's mind, that James is, is still thinking about, like, well, you know, I'm here, I'm in, I'm in Jerusalem, and you know what? Brother Paul, Acts 21, you see how many Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Hmm. As, I'm just going to kind of quote some other verses. As, as concerning the Gentiles, we have already written and concluded that they observe no such thing. See how he keeps making this division? Keeps trying to break it apart, like, yeah, get them away from us. Get them out of here. They conclude no such thing, right? He's never trying to make a bond. He's never trying to be like, oh, Jew and Gentile, married, matched, perfect. It's, it's great, the body of Christ, right? You don't see that. You see him thinking in his mind, we are up here. Well, in the kingdom, are they not up there? Absolutely. What, what happens, the, the, when you look at the Gentiles in relation to, to, to what happens with uh, um, Israel, the, 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 the Gentiles flow unto Israel. They're taught, they're instructed, they're learned. And Israel is the primary focus of the kingdom. Scott and I spent how long? Like an hour and 15 minutes, probably? So, an hour and 45 minutes? I mean, we spent a long time on Wednesday night going through and, and just kind of hammering out all these different issues in, in relation to the kingdom, who's going to be there, what, when they're going to get there, how they get there, all the different gatherings and raptures and things like that that people get confused about. And there's a lot more than just like we were talking. There's a lot more than you just see on this chart, right? This chart is just a very superficial, good basis, you know, for, for a foundational knowledge of the major events. But there's a lot purposefully missing, right? It's there to not confuse you, you know? but I was telling Scott I'm going to get that Clarence Larkin book and show him some of these, some of these things, and it's, it's real cool. I mean, these guys have gone through, and he's, you know, he's just working stuff out. Some of the stuff, I mean, he, he even writes in his notes. I mean, I, this is all conjecture, but you know, based upon these verses, it, it, you have to take these events into account, and that's cool. He's not trying to make a, a determinative conclusion about eschatology or, or prophecy or anything. He will a lot of times just put the verses there and go through, and it's nice to see, like, okay, yeah, we have this event we have to take account for. We have this event that we have to take account for, and we got this event that we have to take account for. The one thing that I, I, I seem to always find lacking is the mystery aspect of what takes place and what, it, what transpires. So it would obviously be in James's mind. He's not going like, yeah, let's bring the body of Christ together. You know, in Christ, there's neither, neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free, male or female. He doesn't say that, right? As concerning the Gentiles, we have written and observed that they observe no such thing. So the, the opposite of that would be, as concerning the Jews, we have written and, 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 and concluded that they do observe all such things. 
because they're why? And here's the reason why I say that. Because, hey, uh, Brother Paul, you see how many Jews there are which believe and they're all zealous of the law? Hmm. The multitudes, they're going to need to come together and find out what it is. You uh, teaching the Gentiles? Who are the Jews among the Gentiles? To forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children nor walk in the customs? Uh-oh. Paul's like, man, am I getting, am I getting like a... You know, an indictment right now? Are, are you guys putting a charge to my head? Are you telling me that I'm guilty of something? Yeah, you are. And the Maltese are needs going to come together. And you better clear the air about this. Clear it up. Don't, don't, don't let anybody say that you're teaching this stuff to the Jews. As concerning the Gentiles, go do whatever you want to do. But with the Jews, you better not dare tell them that they can forsake Moses. So what happens? Does Paul do that? goes in, shaves his head, does the whole bow. You think, oh, okay, they must go good, good, good. No, what do they do? They get so mad at him, and they say, this is the guy, let's kill him, let's hang him, let's get, you know, let's do whatever we can do. And then the Romans come in, they step in, they take him, and they're they going to kill him. So while he's sitting there, the Romans have him in authority, and he speaks in the Hebrew tongue. And I always think about that event that takes place right there in Acts chapter 22. I always think, do the Romans understand what he's saying in the Hebrew tongue? My thought is, no. Right? They have no clue. So when he gets up and he starts speaking in the Hebrew tongue, think about what must be going through the Romans' minds. All the Jews are like, mouths are just shut. They're just stopped. And he's sitting there speaking in that Hebrew tongue. And he's telling them, he's like, man, brethren, you listen to me right now? Do you know what's going on? Do you know what's going on? And he does that. He does like the same thing that who does? He does the same thing that Stephen does in Acts chapter number 7. Right? Doesn't give it to him as hard, but gives it to him pretty, pretty detailed. Right? Same thing like in Acts chapter number 13. Right? Then he goes in Acts chapter 22 and does another just, you know, punch. I mean, it's, it's a punch. But I always think, I'm like, he could have gone a little more. That's what I always think. He could have gone a little bit more. Why didn't you just bust out Romans 10 and just land it right square on their heads? You know? Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for all of you is that you might be saved. And look, I can bear you record because I was one of you that you have a zeal of God. But it's not according to knowledge. For you're ignorant of God's righteousness, and, and you go about the, to establish your own righteousness, and, and you've, not, you know, you've not submitted yourself to the righteousness of God. He would certainly be killed at that point. I mean, dead as a doornail, right? No, no questions asked. They're not going to receive, they're not going to receive his testimony concerning Jesus Christ. So who is that? Does James include it in that? I think at this point in time, Yes. Why? Because you're seeing James infiltrated. You're seeing James affected, ill-affected by the brethren, right? That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. We didn't give them, no, not for an hour. You see how that works? So if, if they're going to go ahead and preach this, what takes place? Well, back it up, back it up. Well, Jason, hold on a second, hold on a second. Peter in Acts chapter 15 just made a blanket statement that everybody, that the just shall live by faith. Yeah, he did. He did. James... James didn't disagree with them, but he let it just, you know, he let it go. He let it go through there. So where are we going? What we're going here is in Acts chapter 2. I want to show you that there is, or Galatians chapter 2. I want to show you that there are groupings of people that are still acting separate, right? They're, they're acting not in, in uniformity. They're not acting together. They're acting as a Jew, and they're acting as a Gentile, and they're acting as opposites. And why is that? I gave you one verse in Acts chapter number 10. One verse that the apostle, that the apostle, okay, Peter, if, if, if he founded the church and he's the, the head of the church, he says one statement in Acts chapter 10, go there, that you're going to have a real tough time with. You're going to have a really tough time with. Because, you know, Acts chapter 10 is a long way, you know, 10 plus years since what? Since the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. A long time. So when you go over here in Acts chapter number 10, and you read down in verse number 28, he says this, And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. Now just stop and think about that just for a second. Are they living like that later on? Absolutely. As soon as the guys from the circumcision come down, he ate. He ate with the Gentiles. And as soon as the circumcision guys came down from James, what does he do? He withdrew himself in so much that Barnabas was carried away with his dissimulation. Barnabas, 
is like the right-hand guy, right, of Paul. Separate unto me who? Paul and Barnabas, right? Or Barnabas and Paul. Separate these guys unto the work which I, whereof I have called them. These guys were doing Gentile ministry, and what do you see? You see Barnabas ill-affected by the brethren. Affected in a negative manner in that he removes himself from the Gentiles. Basically, on this premise right here, that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. It's an unlawful thing. It's a violation of the law. Wow. But, as he says here, God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. See, what God did on the cross through the reconciliation ministry of Jesus Christ was not simply for the Jew, right? This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save this Jewish sinners. No, right? To save sinners of whom I am chief, right? Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first he might show a pattern of, of long suffering forth to all to, uh, to all those who here, hereafter believe in the life everlasting, right? And when you see that, and then you take the, the other verse I was just thinking of is in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, right? The ministry of reconciliation, the word of reconciliation for the what? The world, right? It's not just for like the Jews, it's for the world. So there is this plan, there is this pattern, and, and that's, not even, that's not even mystery stuff, right? It's not, that's not mystery stuff. The reconciliation of the world? No, that's not mystery stuff. We see that all the time. The Gentiles being saved, we see that constantly. Gentile salvation is all, always in there, right? Not through their fall, salvation should come to the Gentiles, but through their rise. And so you're going to have to see that, that that is really difficult to wrap your head around in the beginning. You've got to go, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that there is a future event that must take place in which they have a rise, right? Because there's a lot of prophecies that say they rise up and the Gentiles come to them. And then all of a sudden there's mystery where they fall. And they don't come. So what do you do? Just, just ignore that stuff? Oh, that was uh, that stuff that's a long time ago. That, never, that doesn't have to take place. No, I'm pretty sure every, every word, I mean, just read what Jeremiah says. Jeremiah says, the way you test the prophet, he says, if what he says doesn't come to pass, it's not of God. Right? So that's how you, that's how you tell the prophet's words. And if he's 50-50, he's not of God. So don't, don't believe him. So you have to remember that, that these, these people... You can't just like say, okay, let's take what we know right now and put it in this place. No, we have to separate these guys out. And we have to think about exactly what they're doing contextually at that time. So in Galatians chapter 2, which is the same stuff that's taking place in Acts 15, the reason why they're writing this, you see this, uh, he says, go back to uh, Galatians 2 just for a second. And he says, for before that certain, Galatians 2.12, for before that certain came from James, he did eat with them. He with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews, notice this, dissembled likewise with him. So what happens? It's kind of like the Cowboys and the Patriots, you know? It's like the Steelers and the whatever, you know? I mean, I have a friend who likes the Steelers, and if the Steelers lose, it's a bad day in the office. Like, we walk in the office, and, like, we have friends who are Colts fans or whatever, and I'll walk in there. And everybody's like real hush, hush, quiet. I'm like, hey, what's going on, guys? And then I was like, I'm like, what's up? I'm like, shh. I'm like, what's going on? It's like, it's not the day to joke around. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like Steelers lost last night. I'm like, and so they're like, oh, you don't, you don't know, you don't know how, uh, you don't know how TR is, man. He gets, he gets really upset about the Steelers losing. And I'm thinking, so I'm like, it's, it's. It's just a game. I mean, it is what it is. But these are, these are guys basically being like, I'm going to align myself with the Jews. I'm going to be a Jew, right? They love living like the Gentiles. Why did the Jews come down from Jerusalem into Galatia? To spy out their liberty, which we had in Christ, right? What is this thing you guys talking about? You ain't got to keep the law. You ain't got to circumcise your kids. What kind of bunk nonsense is this? This sounds like heresy. Bunch of heretics. And Paul's like, no, 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 you got it the opposite way around. Actually, you're the heretics. Can you just imagine what would be going through their heads? They think they know something. They really think they have this down. And then for Paul to be like, yeah, no, it's, it's really not circumcision, that which is of the flesh. You know, That was a symbol, and, and you missed the symbol. You missed the mark. You don't get it. And as a result, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of what you do. Wow. 
that's got to hit him hard. I mean, why couldn't you just, you know, in Galatians, or in, in Acts chapter 21, just hit him with, like, the end of Romans 2 and, like, the beginning of Romans 3 and then, like, Romans 10 and then, like, you know, if he would have done all that, he would have thrown all the punches, but I, I think we know the reason why. He, he comes into them privily, you know. He does it, he does it so that unless he'd run in vain. Well, he already is going to run in vain. Christ told him that. That was a prophecy. You know, they're not going to receive your testimony. They're not going to listen to you. So why bother? Just, you, might as well, you might as well do what? Speak the truth in love and just, just hit him with it, you know. It's, it's the only way that they're going to get it. I mean, it took Paul being blinded to get it, right? He had to be physically blinded. And when you lose your sight, you're like, oh, I'll do anything for it back, please, please. I remember one time when I was a little kid, a kid had a Dr. Pepper in a two-liter bottle, and he shook it up really hard, and he opened it up, and it went in my eyes. And for like 30 minutes, I couldn't see anything. I mean, like it, like, it went in my eyes. Like, it burned my eyes. And, you know, Dr. Pepper is basically like muriatic acid, you know, like, they, they clean blood off the streets with it, you know, I mean, it's like, it's pretty gross, and I remember my eyes like burning for 30 minutes, I thought I'm going to go blind, and uh, I did think about Paul during that time, but I was like, you know, this is, this is, this is intense, but, you know, you have, when you have a loss of one of your, uh, you know, perceptory or receptory, you know, uh, type of faculties, what happens? Well, your brain starts thinking a lot. When you lose your eyesight, and you don't have any eyesight, well, you have a lot less distractions. You can't play on Facebook, you know, you can't really uh, surf Instagram, you can't Snapchat. I mean, not like Paul was doing any of that, but we today do that, and then you, you have more time to think on things, right? That's why when you close your eyes, you can really concentrate and focus on stuff a little better. So I'm sure Paul, when he had, didn't have his eyesight for a little while, you know, I'm pretty sure he sat there and contemplated life, and he contemplated what he thought about, and he contemplated like, wow, um, maybe I'm wrong. No, no, I, I think I am wrong. And uh, yeah, what am I gonna do about that, right? And so the way he obtains mercy is just absolutely ridiculous to me. It's like, it's, it's still, it's mind-blowing to think that that's what, you know, the person who is the most deserving of the wrath of God receives grace. So anyways, I want to show you this, this thing. And, and they dissemble likewise, the Jews dissemble likewise with them, insomuch that Barnabas was carried away with dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I sent to Peter before them all. And this is him rebuking them that sin before all that others may fear. He says, if thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentile. See, see how that works? He's, he's, he's doing what they're doing. He's like, all right, if you're a Jew, and you're living as the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, what's he saying? Jews live in this totally different way. They're doing all these things. So what does modern Christendom live like, for the most part? They're more Jewish than they are, you know, Christian. They really do. They operate way more in Judaism than they do in Christianity. I mean, that's why the rhetoric of them doing the, the things that they do, these, these, these rote tasks and these the stuff that they, they accomplish, they do it so blindly just because, like, well, my father did it, my dad did it, well, I'm a Baptist because my dad's a Baptist. Well, what's a Baptist? Well, I don't know. Well, don't you think you should probably figure that out? Maybe, maybe think about it for a second? Well, I'm a Methodist. Okay, why are you Methodist? My mom's a Methodist. My dad was a Methodist. My grandma's a Methodist. It's just like the Steelers and the Patriots. You like those because your dad likes them, and he walks around with the flag, too. So, hoorah, rah, why don't you, you know, look for the truth as opposed to just, you know, following in? Why? It's easier, is it not? Isn't it easier just to go along with the flow? Is it hard to fight upstream? Yeah, ask the salmon, right? I mean, it's, it's not, a, not an easy task to do that, and that's why you're going to get a lot of flack for it, right? So uh, showing you that, they have, that there are uh, Jews and Gentiles, he says, why compel us the Gentiles to live as to the Jews? All right, now, now we're coming back here, okay? Why do you compel the Gentiles to live as the Jews? Now let's get back to Romans chapter, or Acts chapter 15 and verse number 20, and let's talk about these things. These are the, these are the four things that he lays out here, the four things you go, okay, well, well Jews and Gentiles, if they're going to live together in this, in this you know, church, we have a problem because these Jews are easily offended because they've been living underneath this incredible law that has really been a huge burden to them. And their conscience is always affected, right? And your conscience, what your conscience does, as we'll look in a little bit, your conscience can continue, continually condemn you. And underneath the law of Moses, that's what your conscience is going to continually do. Your conscience will continually condemn you over and over and over again. The end of Romans 14, which we'll look at here in just a little bit, he, he talks about that. He says, uh, the man that, that, that his conscience condemneth him not, Right? So how does that work? How, how are we going to accomplish that? Well, we're going to have to have some way to keep the peace. And, and, and Paul really does want to keep the peace. James wants to keep the peace. He wants to keep unity. James says that there's no need for the Jews to keep the law, the Gentiles to keep the law of Moses. There's no need for them to do that. There's no need for them to be circumcised. 
So what do you think he does? Does he just you know, bust out a copy of the tablets and says, here, here's the tablets, go walk around and hand these out to everybody and we're good to go? The table's a testimony, right? That's what I'm talking about. It's the ten, the ten Commandments. Is that what he just does? He gives everybody a copy here. Get this down to, to the Ephesus church. Get that down to Galatia. Later to see again. No. What's he do? He says, well, we've got to write him some stuff. What do you mean you've got to write him some stuff? What, what, what do we need to write him for? Don't we have the Bible? Don't we have the law of Moses? Well, no. We need to give him some new information. We need to give him some stuff. We need to give him some, some clarification about the Bible. And what this shows you is that there is a need for clarification about the Bible. Is there not? Yes. If you're going to read the book of Deuteronomy without understanding for example, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you're going to have a big problem, right? If we gave the Gentiles of that day and said, here, here's Deuteronomy, have fun and read it, well, number one, they're going to be like, hey, this has nothing to do with us, <laughs> right? Isn't that the first thing that they're going to read and they're going to get that? They're going to go, ah, it has nothing to do with the Gentiles. Basically, every time it mentions Gentiles, it's in the negative light. Any other nations, it's in the negative light. So it's a it's necessity for them to get some explanation about how they're going to function as a unified body, in the sense that what? Things that will help keep the peace. That's basically what it is. So the four things he says, he says this, verse number 20, but that we write unto them, and now here's the question, does that include the Jews? I say no, right? I say no, because he's still making this distinction. He says, we Jews, leaders, elders, apostles up here in Jerusalem, you know, we write unto them, that they, Jews, I'm sorry, Jews, no, Gentiles, yes, that they do what? They abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. So he names four things. Now, we, do, we jokingly said are the pollutions of idols, you know, their, their CO2 emissions, you know? No. Are they going to buy carbon credits? No. What are they? The pollutions of idols, if you go over to verse number 29, it says that ye abstain from meats offered idols. See, there's pollutions of idols, right? Definitions, working themselves out as you continually read. So in verse number 20, but we, have, we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Now, is this stuff that, Jew, that Gentiles must have been doing? Yes, right? Where, where did Jews get the ideas of let's, let's go worship gen, uh, idols and, and having the idol worships and feasts and things like that? They got all that from where? How many years did they spend in Egypt again? Anybody? Anybody? 400 years? That's a long time, right? And, and, and how many generations is that? Lots. Lots of generations? And as generations go and as generations go, don't they forget stuff? Yeah. And, and do you think that, that they were affected a little bit by the Egyptians and their paganness? Absolutely, right? How, how much so? Well, turn to, turn to, to Exodus chapter 20. I'm going to show you a couple examples of this, okay? Exodus chapter 20. God miraculously, you know, takes the people out of Egypt. Miraculously is an understatement. We should just call it the miracles upon miracles upon miracles upon miracles, right? I mean, how many miracles did he do just to take them out of the land of Egypt? A lot. I mean, they, and they, they do, and they also, we're going to see, they're going to attribute those miracles to false gods in a second. So in Exodus chapter number 20, you know, he says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Note that real, you know, firm in your memory. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Who brought, who brought him out of the land of Egypt? I am, right? God. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I brought you out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other, little g, gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to, to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the fourth, third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Okay. He makes it real clear, abundantly clear, that they should abstain from worshiping idols. That they should abstain. They should not, should not create any graven images. They should not build unto them any idols of false gods. Because there's no need. Because I am the one that took you out of the land of Egypt. Right? 
the reason why they don't need to do that is because there's no, there's, there's no need because they didn't take you out of the land of Egypt because I took you out of the land of Egypt. I delivered you. I saved you. Now, when you go over to Exodus, go over to chapter 32. And read in verse number... Uh, We'll just read one. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. What? Are you guys that dumb? You guys already forget it? No, listen. He says, And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. Aaron, what now? Buddy, Aaron. No, 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 no. no. What, what, what is that all about? He's like, yeah, we're... Well, this is what we did in Egypt, right? Let's do it. He's like, it's been a little while. Maybe he's a little pent up. He says, let's have a pagan sex feast. That's what they're going to do. And this is exactly what takes place here. All of the things that you see that he lists in those four things, James lists, are because of what they do here. I mean, it's the fornication. It's the, it's the offering, the pollutions of idols. It's the things strangled. It's the meats, how they offer them. It's what they do. And look what he says. He says, and they all break off their golden earrings, which were in their ears, and they brought them unto Aaron, and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten, what? What do you make it into? A molten calf. We're going to look at what Jeroboam does in, 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 uh, in, in, in First Kings in just a second, but he does, the same, he does the same stuff. They do the same thing. They start making these gods. It's like, well, dude, how do you guys forget this stuff? We look at it and go, man, you're just so foolish. But he says, they make a own calf, and they took, and he said these words, these be thy gods. Do you think that's going to make God a little jealous? think he's going to be a little bit angry at them, a little heated for that? Yes. He says, these be the gods of Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And they do all this stuff, and they made a proclamation. And what does he say? Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. What Lord? And he says, and they rose up early in the morning and offered burning offerings and brought down peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And Moses hears you know, about this through God, and God says unto Moses, the Lord said to Moses, says, Hey, go get thee down for thy people, which thou brought us up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. See, I like how he says that because God's like, Well, from the physical aspect, technically you let them out. I mean, now I, I, I allowed that to take place, and I separated the waters, and, and I made Pharaoh's heart, heart uh, you know, to, to break, and all those things, but you technically took them out of there, so you're, uh, these are your people. These are your guys. These are your corrupt little seeds that you took out of Egypt, right? They turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They made them a molten calf, have worshipped it, have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be the gods of Israel which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen the people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, for, now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax out against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. And, of course, Moses makes this whole big plea. Please, please, God, please, don't, don't, don't kill them, don't kill them, Right? Comes down, makes the, makes the kids all drink the stuff. And going to, over to verse number 24, read what it says here. He says, And I said unto them, this is what Aaron says, And Aaron said unto them, uh, Whosoever hath gold, uh, let them break off. This is 32, 24 of Exodus. Uh, Aaron said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me. And, and then I cast it into the fire. And there came out this calf. Wait, that's not what happened. If you remember, actually, he, he, uh, he took a graving tool and he made it that way. He's a liar. But then going on a little further, he says, Then I cast it into the fire and there came out this calf. When Moses saw that the people, notice this, the people were what? Were naked. So I think probably, you know, obviously the, the, the writing of this, Moses is not going to, you know, put in there. They committed heinous acts of fornication, things that you're only, you know, that you would, your parents told you never to do. You know, I mean, these, this, is, this is the kind of stuff that these guys are doing. Why are they naked? Okay, that's, that's why they're naked, okay? They're having, they're doing fornication things. And he says, and when they saw the people were naked for Aaron and made them naked under their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gates and said, what, what did Aaron do? Aaron said, take off your clothes, let's all party. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from the gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. So obviously there's way more than 3,000 that came out of Egypt. So who, who fell? Well, those are all the defiant people who are standing outside of their gate. They're outside of their outside their, their their tents, you know, probably mocking and probably drunk as can be, you know, saying, you know, no, we don't care about this, we don't care what you're gonna do, and 
off with their heads. That's, that's how it goes down. So if you go over to the book of 1 Kings for a second, there's a constant reminder, right? If you read through the rest of the scripture, there's a constant, constant, constant reminder, right? That, that God took Israel out of the land of Egypt, right? Constant reminder of that. And in 1, 1 Kings, chapter number 12, and look at verse number 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out thence and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up and do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto the Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of, of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. Where are they getting these calves from? Where are they getting this idea from, right? Have you ever seen like Egyptian you know, art and Egyptian idols? What do you always see? You see a lot of those, you know, let's see a lot of those calves. You see a lot of like, you know, bulls and goats and, and uh, things like that. I mean, the, the, if you've all, probably some of you guys know what the Baphomet goat head is. One of the symbolisms of Satanism, right? Yes? No? Maybe? Have you ever seen that? It's uh, pretty interesting. It's got, it, it, you just type in Baphomet goat head, B-A-P-H-O-M-A-T goat head. And you'll see the Baphomet symbol. That's a symbol of Satanism, but it's really, it goes back Prior to that, it's a symbol of all these all these gods, and, and it's got the bullhorn and the goat face and the stuff like that. Whenever you think of a picture of Satan, don't you think of things like that? You think of, I, that's my, my thought is, I always think of like the goat head. There's these old comic books, Russ, Frank, maybe you guys remember these, way back in the day. I don't, they're, they gotta be, they gotta be 70s. 70s comic books. They're made by a Christian guy, and they were all about like the rapture and prophecy and eschatology. Any of you guys remember these things? Check, check. No, it wasn't Chick. It was some other guy. It was very similar. It was, it was actually full-blown, like, comic books. And I remember, like, my, my parents had them because, you know, my parents were into all that stuff in terms of, like, whatever. So I had these, these comic books. And I had Spider-Man and Batman and all that stuff when I was, like, 10 years old. I had these comic books, and these are the scariest things I've ever seen. I mean, I would show my friends these things. You, I have to find them. I'll have to ask my parents. They probably still have them. I'll bring them in sometime. They are the scariest things you've ever seen. I mean, the pictures that they have of, like, Satan and stuff, I'm like, that is the most corrupt, evil-looking thing I've ever seen in my life. And to this day, I can, like, picture it, and it's just, like, it's just so evil-looking. It always had, like, a kind of like a goat, a goat head or a cow head or a bull head and these weird horns, and it was just, like, just in snakes. Snakes? Right. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Ouch. Hey, it's true. Uh, so anyways, he says, he says, whereupon the king took counsel, made two calves of gold. So they have these calves. They got this idea from where? They got this idea from Egypt. That's where they were doing this. And he said unto them, is it too much for you to go up to Jerusalem? Now notice he say, behold, thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. I mean, look at these guys. These are kings. These are leaders. These are what they do. This is how corrupt these people are. And he says, and he set, set the one in Bethel and the other one he put in Dan. Scott had asked me, he's like, we're talking about how many people are going to be resurrected into the kingdom. And I said, I think there's a lot fewer people in Israel that were saved than you think there will be, right? When he says that they're going to come down from the east and the west to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to, to eat in the kingdom, eat and drink in the kingdom, right? The funny part is about that, it's like, that might be all of them. I'm, I'm kidding, but, you know, th that's how few there really are in Israel that are really saved, that really were ever justified by faith. The rest of them all day long were, were trying to attempt righteousness by works, and the prime example of that is the generation and generation and generations that followed that ended up with the people who crucified Christ, right? That's how you kind of see that. That's, that's, that's how far they got. That's what they were always doing. But what does he do? And he says, and this became a sin. Uh, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. He made a house of the high places and made the priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordered what? Ordained a feast. So he did this, like, this whole like feasting and eating and these fornication ceremonies and all this stuff that they do. It's very common. You go, no, it's not. This, this is ridiculous. There's no, there's no fornication feast ceremonies. I mean, did you ever read the book of 1 Corinthians? I mean, did you read the stuff that they were doing in there? Um, definitely lots of idol worship. Uh, plenty of fornication, right? And not that they had mourned, but they're praising the guy for what he did. Hey, he slept with your father's wife. You know, all this kind of stuff. Like, what? And they're saying, that's completely fine. That's, that's acceptable, right? So Paul's laying out some things, you know, obviously with James here in Acts chapter 15, that is, that is neg negative, negative to do, and it's not beneficial, right? So going back to Acts chapter 15, he says, But we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. Now, the, the pollutions of idols, those things that are coming from the, the meats that are offered to idols. Now, is an idol anything? What does Paul say? Paul says, we know that an idol is nothing. Okay? 
He's like, he doesn't, it doesn't even like bother him. He's like, we know what an idol is. Nothing. It's nothing. It's literally nothing. We don't even have to even call it an idol. It's literally nothing. It's something made with man's hands. These art, these graven devices, all of this stuff. Speak. Talk to me. Tell me something. No, it can't do it. It's dumb. I like how Paul, that Paul and many other people throughout the scripture call them dumb idols. You know, that's what they are. They're dumb because they can't speak. They can't talk. They don't communicate. They're just little things that you make to make you feel better. So these 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 meats that are going to be offered in these ceremonies, it would obviously be very common, perhaps during this sacrificial system, for them to have a little leftover meat, and you might sit down at a feast and. Or dinner, Paul goes in to evangelize some Gentiles, or Barnabas does, or somebody else comes in, and they bust out some meat. Well, is there any prohibition against them eating meat? No. Right? They all meat they took, so that's what they were doing in Right, right. So, so these guys, if they, if they come in and they bring meat, there's, there's not a problem with meat, right? There's, there's no, like, prohibition against eating meat. They're not like, you know, Jesus says they, he was hungry and they went and got meat. Jesus wasn't a vegetarian. People like to say that he was a vegetarian or he was a huge pacifist. And I made this statement the other day, and it's very offensive. It's maybe one of the most offensive statements I'm going to say from the pulpit. Not truly offensive, but it's, it's very interesting to think about. And I told Scott last week, I said, Jesus Christ will kill more people than Hitler. I mean, and I said, Jesus Christ will kill more people than Mao Zedong. And you start going through all the people. I mean, the amount of, the, when the nations and nations and nations gather against Jesus Christ and try to kill him, I mean, try to, try to overrun in Jerusalem, I like how we said at the very end there, at the end of the kingdom, when Satan's lifted out of the pit and, uh, and he's left to go out and run, run around amok for a little bit and deceive the nations, the verse is one verse, <laughs> how, how long the battle takes place, and it's over, right? Like, and we're not putting up with this, and it's done, right? So how many people think die during that period of time? How many people die during the tribulation? I mean, that's why you have to really understand who Jesus Christ is as the righteous judge of all the earth, you know? Lowly, meek, mild Jesus, as Russ used to always say. A little baby in the manger, he ain't offensive to anybody. He ain't judging nobody. Everybody's like, oh, we love Jesus in the manger. But let's, let's, let's you know, of course, always remember who he is. But remembering this, this kind of concept here of, of who people are, are, are worshiping, they're definitely, you know, there's plenty of Gentiles who do not have knowledge about, let's just go to 1 Corinthians 8. That's, that's where I want to take you. And then we'll have to close with this, and we'll pick up next week. So Corinthians, obviously, what is the major point, point of this, this, this book? <laughs> Reproof, right? Definitely. Rebuke for sin. I mean, these guys are, they're, uh, there's divisions among you. There's problems in the church. There's, there's completely a bunch of contentions. There's issues of baptism. There's issues of justification. There's issues of, yeah, pretty much. Christianity is found in 1 Corinthians. So going over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 8, Paul says this. He says, now it's touching things offered unto idols, right? This is something that's really important. He says, we know that we all have knowledge. He says, we know about this. We understand what happens. We get it. It's nothing that we're um, not understanding. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. What is the main purpose of Paul's everything he does, right? It means charity, right? Without, without charity, without love, I, I am nothing. It right? doesn't matter what you do, unless you're doing it for the purpose of edification, charity, then it's nothing. He says, if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. That's because the knowledge of God, as he's already talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, is not the wisdom of this world. He says, if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. Notice that. We know. Does everybody have that same knowledge? No. Some people get real weirded out about that. Some of the new converts of Gentile, from the Gentiles who are believers now might have these huge convictions about these things and might be like, well, hold on a second. This is, this is some serious stuff. I don't know if I want to do it. And some of the Jews might be like, no way. We ain't ever getting near any meats offered uh, to idols. Well, when you do that, you know what you do? You make the idol pretty powerful, huh? You say that, no, that, that meat's got some voodoo magic on it or something like that. No, it doesn't. Not at all. That mean, that's nothing. Idols are nothing. The meat's offered to idols are nothing anyways. It doesn't matter. Look what he says. He says, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. For there, for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in the earth, as there be gods many and lords many. He says, people call lots of things gods. People call lots of things lords. But there's only one. 
And he says, but to us, see how he's doing this? He's saying, these people, the we's, but we and us, those are the people with what? Those are the people with knowledge. The people who don't have knowledge are the guys who are very offended. And, oh no, you're going to eat things that are offered to idols. This is, this is a problem. Look what he says. He says, for though there be that called gods, whether in heaven or earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him... Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. And you know what happens in that situation? Turn to Romans chapter 14, and we're going to pick up with this next week. I'm going to show you what takes place. This is what takes place. Romans chapter 14. And read in verse number 21. He says, it is, a, it is good neither to eat flesh nor drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. Right? So what happens is these guys don't have knowledge and their conscience gets in the way of them. And they get condemned really unnecessarily. And so Paul says, you know, look, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And so these guys are thinking, and this is a really interesting verse. I mean, I can unpack that for hours. But he that doubteth is damned. Well, he that doubteth is damned in which sense? He's condemned of himself, right? That's what he's saying in verse number 22. He's condemned of himself. And there's plenty of other verses that we go over to 15, 14, and so on and so forth. But at the end, he says in verse 15, he says, We then that are strong... What does that mean? We then that have knowledge, we then that get it, right? We can't just run in here and be like, oh, yeah, let's eat. The, oh, the church is going crazy. The Jews are going, yeah, you guys can't eat that stuff. What are you doing? Right? Don't you think they're going to be like that? They're going to they're gonna be weirded out. So what are we going to do? We're going to say, no, 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 okay? He's like, here's the deal, okay? When the Jews are gathered together, do things to keep unity, please. And it's not that hard just to avoid this stuff, Okay? Paul, James says, these things, you know, if you do, you know, fare you well, right? He doesn't say, like, magically you're going to get all these powers or God's going to be super happy with you. He says, do this, fare you well, right? These are, these are just things that will help you. It will help this unity between Jews and Gentiles. He says, he that doubteth is damned, he eat, what, because he eateth not of faith, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. We then that are strong, strong in faith, obviously, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, those who are what? Weak in faith. Because as you, be, as you began Romans chapter 14, he says, Him that is weak in faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, and other who is weak eateth herbs. See how he says how that works? Those who are weak in faith are those who do not what? Those who do not believe. So what is Paul trying to do? He's trying to communicate to them words that they can eventually believe, so that they can grow up, they can mature, they can be strong in the faith, and that we will bear the infirmities of the weak, and not just to please ourselves, and this is the whole concept of everything in verse 2. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Right? Real, real easy. Just, just let's, let's do the stuff that's going to help these guys out. We understand not everybody has this knowledge. 1 Corinthians 8, we're going we're gonna to get into that a little bit more. We can teach these people. We can get them to that position. But, uh, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the same situations. And he goes through it in more detail about what he does and how it works. And then... You know, later on, we'll, we'll get into some of these the days, months, weeks, and years in Colossians, and he's a little bit more you know, firm with that. So uh, next week, what we'll pick up with is we're going to talk about you know, avoiding the conscience offenders with the mixed group. We're going to get into the unity of the spirit that's divided by the flesh. We're going to talk about the, the, the issues of not eating blood, the, the strangers that are commanded not to eat blood either. And then we're going to talk about how, you know, the pouring out of the blood and what that all means. And then we'll get into the issues of, of fornication and then Moses and him being read on the Sabbath and a bunch of other stuff that's on my list. So 21 weeks it will be. So let's close in prayer.